And as you heard from his intro, my guest today on the Paracave podcast, well, he's a Canberra Raiders fan, massive Canberra Raiders fan, and he's also pretty famous for some of the satire comedy songs that he has written from over the years, a couple of Parramatta songs, and probably the most notable one is probably This Is, this is uh, That's In Queensland, uh, the origin one, which is, I think, now 10 years old, so time has flown. But he's a multi-award winning and talented musician, uh, also a contributor to the Paracave podcast behind me there. You can see just up in the top there, top near the near this one, the oh, Nathan Highmarsh. Oh, there it is. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, contributed to the Paracave podcast, the Nathan Highmarsh poster as well. Welcome to the Paracave podcast, Mr. Dennis Carnahan. Thanks for having me. Not a problem. Not a problem. Now, as I said, you're a massive Canberra Raiders fan, so I'm assuming. Did what was growing up like for yourself? Was that did is that where you grew up down in the Canberra region? And yeah, yeah, born and born and raised in Canberra, and uh, that's where the the fanship come from. I I, I was originally a Manly fan. Um, Ooh, okay. I was. I was assigned that by my big brothers in 1973. I was a little brother and they were going to watch the grand final and they were all going for the Sharks. So I thought that that meant Manly were the underdogs and Manly won. So I was like, hoo hoo. But they, none of them were Sharks fans. They were either Dragons or Rabbits, which kind of says their age that the old two were Dragons fans because when they were, you know, real little, the Dragons were winning everything. And then the, yeah. the next youngest one to me, his, um, when he was real, when he was little, it was the South winning things. And then I got given Manly. <laughs> um, but I kind of kept being a Manly fan when the Raiders joined. But just yes, once you get to see it over and see there's people you know playing, this, you know, a guy I went to school with is playing half. Um, oh, he, he was older than me, but like, there's no, you know, there's, I think there's this thing like that was my team. They were, they yeah. were my hometown team. They were, so I, I stuck with them. Uh, did you find rugby league or did rugby league find you growing up? <laughs> uh, I think it was actually Canberra's, um, uh, it's a multicultural city. So there's, you know, when I was a kid, Saturday was AFL, Sunday was league. Well, it was VFL. Um, that was what was on the tally locally. Um, I played a couple of years of soccer. I played a couple of years of union, um, terrible at him played afl and league at school um had a go at league it just i wasn't good with the contact at all i was yeah. terrible at it plus you know the ability to catch run pass tackle yeah. they, they yeah. all pass me by everything that you need to do to <laughs> be a rugby league player. well just the basics were missing um so i worked out i was much better as a fan um but it was more it was once the raiders came in just they, they came in at a time when canberra was hitting critical mass as a town because it's always been seen of as a blowing town because it's all, you know, public servants and everyone says it's politicians, but there's, there's like, I don't know if any, there's no politicians in Canberra. They're all in their electorates and they occasionally come yeah. to Canberra to do politics, to do sit in parliament. Um, but most of them spend their time in their electorates. So there is a lot of public servants, but they have an average of two to three years in Canberra. So that's kind of how it was from the, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s onwards until, well, Menzies moved parliament there and public service there. Um, that was in the 50s. But a late 70s, early 80s, mid 80s, there was kind of a critical mass of locals of people who actually had local businesses, small businesses, you know, shops, cafes, a lot of it serving public servants and 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 that sort of thing. But, you know, building industry um, and people who started living there for a long time. My dad was, was a uni lecturer. And so he was there in 1958 and he stayed there. So, um a lot of those sort of people. And so it, it's like the population was like 140,000, yeah. um, but it had enough to feel like a country town. Like there were people who were locals who were born and raised there, which hadn't happened before. And that coincided with the Raiders getting onto the big stage in 87. And so the whole town suddenly, rather than being a bunch of blow-ins and public servants and people from Melbourne, it was like, we got something. We're, we're a town. We have an identity. Sure. We lost to Manly, but, you know, we, we had something. Then when the one in 89, I'd left Canberra. So suddenly that was my conduit. That was my home. That was my connection okay. to home was watching yeah. the Raiders. I've been stuck with it ever since. So you said that you sort of still followed Manly 
uh, when Kia became in a competition. Where were you in 87? What sort oh, of 100% test Raiders. Hundred percent raided by that stage. Gone. Hated Manly. Was with the rest of the world. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> including yeah, Manly. Hating yeah, Manly. So yeah, true. that was um. Yeah, I've still got a little tiny bit of sympathy because my son goes for them. Okay. Um, and it's my closest local ground, so you know. But <laughs> yeah. when they have controversies like Rainbow Pride jerseys, and when they uh when they implode and then sack Jeff Tuvey as coach, like they still wow. Yeah. They wow. do things different over there. There's that famous banner, I think, that you see on the hill sometimes. Everyone, um, we hate you too oh, as well. Guess oh. what? Manly hates you too. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah. The funny thing is that's directed at Manly fans. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Manly fans hate Manly. <laughs> yeah. So who were some of your favourite players, um, obviously, in those early days of the Raiders? I mean, there were some champion players back in the day. Uh, so a lot of the like Ashley Gilbert was always a huge okay. favorite. Yeah. Um, and I, he still is, even though he's not playing anymore because he, he goes to all the games. So he goes to the home games. He leaves Crookwell. He drives from his sheep farm in Crookwell <laughs> to Bruce stadium, gets there for you know, when there was 23s, when there's under twenties, whatever he yeah. gets there early. He doesn't come with the, the big badge. I, Played in the '87 Grand Final. I was a you know Raiders legend. He just turns up in his farm shirt and his jeans. <laughs> nice. um, doesn't have a pass. Just pays his ticket. Pays his. Me- I, I don't actually. I don't know if he pays his membership. He may well, but he he like I've seen him behind the scenes and you know in the dressing rooms and stuff. But mainly he sits out on the concourse having okay. beers with his mates from his farm. Yeah, nice. Nice. Ooh. What he's doing? Got your audio there. Um, I'm back, but videos is switched off. And we're back. There you go. Don't you're know back. what the hell happened there. My computer just had a little systemic Moment. freak out. Um, so yeah, Ashley Gilbert remains one of my favourites. Um, but then you know, Chrissy O'Sullivan's the one who I, I went to school with him. Okay. And I, went to, I was in class with his little sister. Um, so he was a hero of mine growing up, even before the Raiders came in. He played in, in my local union team and my local league team as okay. a junior. And he was yeah. he was a gun. Um, Matty Corkery was a big favourite. Oh, and Craig yeah. Corkery and, and also Craig Bellamy. Um, okay, yeah. There was just something about those um, awkward country kids that was really appealing. And I guess Bellamy wasn't, you know, full local. He was from Oberon, but you know that was all we saw. So that we, and Maddie Corkery being a genuine Queanbeyan boy loved that. So yeah, those those are some of my early favourites. Yeah, no, nah, I mean it's good there that you mentioned um, some of the I guess you could call lesser known players, although uh, people would know their names. Obviously, Raiders fans would know their names, but oh, everyone uh, knows Bellamy. But well, yeah. But, but Ashley Gilbert, probably not everyone would yeah. know. Um, yeah. Chris O'Sullivan, yeah, people would know him uh, kicking the field goal in the grand final. Yeah. Um, moment. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It was just such a um, champion team, those early, uh, late 80s, early 90s, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, that was we had the, the Queenslanders come and join us in, um, uh, you know, 85, 86 with – and and that was a really funny moment when Mel signed. That was a huge turning point because there was all this scuttlebutt around Sydney, particularly from Phil Gould and various <laughs> others saying that, yeah, okay, they can make it in origin, but how are they going to go week in, week out of the grind of a, you know, 20 week premiership, whatever. And uh, so there was no belief. There was a belief that Mel Meninga, Gary Belcher, Peter Jackson, uh, Gary Coyne, Steve um, um, Boxhead Walters, that they'd, you know, once the time wore on, they just wouldn't be up to it. And how wrong they were. They certainly were up to it. That's it. So obviously making the grand final 87, massive achievement. But we fast forward to 89. What was that feeling like when you actually got that premiership win, the first ever in the club's oh, history? That was funny. So I went to 87. Um Mum bought us tickets to 87. We flew up on Anset and then got a bus oh, from yeah. the airport. And um I I'd, 
we went with two with uh, my brother and a mate, and we're all. She bought us Woodge's jerseys, and the jersey still fits. I'm pretty happy with that. Nice. Um, and and we um, I we were drinking. We just got on the cans. We we on the flight up, and then on the bus there was beers on the bus, and we went to some place, some big place in Chinatown, a big food barn for lunch, and then we more beers there. Got to the ground, beers, watch reserve grade beers, and by the time great fire <laughs> happened, we were just. Woo! Yeah, yeah. Then we we got on the plane home. The plane up was a chartered plane. The plane home was um just a, a public plane, and so me and about ten others on there, we just started getting pieces of paper. We got asked the hostess for pieces of paper and coloured pencil. Who writing out the words of the green machine, okay. and just handed it out all through the plane. We made like one hundred and fifty copies, and then just started saying <laughs> bad and really da, da, da. the green. Yeah, we got the whole yeah. plane going. Wow. So, Amazing. So yeah, we kind of didn't care that we'd lost that one. Um, there was eighty nine. I'd actually moved out of Canberra, and was at uni in Lismore, and um, was living on campus. And uh, it was a it was a wonderful moment. There was um, during State of Origin because Lismore was close to the border. A heap of Queenslanders got like half of the students were from Queensland. Okay. And so State of Origin on campus, I was living in this like block of flats, and you know, there's one hundred and fifty people there. And generally all 150 plus a mate each would converge on one flat. And so there's okay, like yeah. 300 <laughs> people out in this yard yeah. and anyone scores a try, it's just on. And there were like, there was, there was blood, there was bruising. There was, there was a couple of broken windows and people rolling into them. Um, <laughs> but there was, it was all good natured, but there were punches thrown when, when New South Wales scored, the Queenslanders would jump on and pile on it. I guess. So it was just, it was mayhem. But at the end of it, I was saying, it doesn't matter that Queensland's won. This doesn't matter. What matters is the premiership. And that's what the Raiders are going to win. And, the, and okay. the, you know, State yeah. of Origin is just toy town. And this, this means nothing. And um, so I was watching the grand final with a bunch of these Queenslanders who were my mates. And Mel Meninga at the, like, and I was devastated. When when Ciro scored that try before half time, it's like, we've been dominant and they're ahead on the scoreboard. This is, you know, which is now the Raiders way. <laughs> Dominate, get ahead on the scoreboard. Then the other <laughs> team comes back, and then they beat you. Okay, yeah. Uh, um, for the last quarter of a century. Um, but when so I was pretty despondent, and uh, then the second half, the way that all unfolded, and the way the drama of it, and the reversed penalty, the penalty going the wrong way against Bruce Maguire, and like it was, and then the you know the try by um, Chico, the basketball pass from Laurie Daly, it was. Um, just so much drama. And then Mel Meninga at the very end goes, this is what it's all about. This beats Origin. This beats playing for Australia. This is what it's all about, winning the premiership with these blokes you work with all year. And the Queenslanders are all going, shit. Yeah. And you're there saying, oh, I told you that. <laughs> I told you. So, yeah, that was great. And plus the uni tipping contest. I was in a tipping contest. It was like uh, eight or 900 people in it, and you pay a dollar to enter. A dollar back in those days worth something. Yeah. Um, and the first prize was five hundred bucks. Second prize was two hundred bucks. Last prize, uh, if you came last, you got a hundred. And about okay. ten weeks out, about ten weeks out, I was, um, you know, middle of the pack, doing pretty bad. And then for the rest of the season after Origin, I just started tipping who who the Raiders plus who the Raiders needed to lose for them to climb up the ladder. Okay. And I, I got like in the last eight weeks, I reckon six times I got eight out of eight. Oh, it was eight. However many there were. Yeah, I think it was eight yeah. out of eight. Um, so I just kept blitzing it. So I went from middle of the pack, bang, won the competition. Yeah, wow. Well, smart and, um, strategy. It was, well, <laughs> it was a great timing for it. But then um, being a uni student and had a couple of beers, like, ah, bugger it, put the whole lot on the bar at the tats. <laughs> 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 yeah, had a great night. Yeah, that's it. And then they back up in 1990 and win the comp again against Penrith. Um, and then... Lose to Penrith the year after. How how did that go after winning two in a row, going oh. for that three peat? I wasn't. It's pretty hard to be disappointed, like when you've won two in a row. And also with Penrith, I was by the time that game happened, I I was playing in a band. We were touring around. That I was actually I actually watched that um at the entrance at the okay. uh, the nightclub we were playing at. We were setting up, and I was sitting watching it, and. I was pretty disappointed until Royce Simmons scored that try and and made that 
you know, 10 meter dash it looked like it was a hundred meters and the, you know, <laughs> a thousand steps of Roycey going. And it's like, how can someone not tackling when they kept coming and coming, just couldn't get there. And the height he jumped, you know, he's leapt to his feet and I just thought, oh, you know what? You just got to love Roycey. And so it's, it's hard. I didn't get that disappointed. Like it was, you know, sure. We've had two. It would have been nice to get the three Pete to equal the eels. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, it wasn't to be. And it's really hard to dislike the team that had, you know, Roy Simmons, Greg Alexander, um, Brad Fittler, Mark Geyer, that it was really hard to dislike him. So, yeah, didn't mind it. Yeah, no, I, I must admit, in the early, uh, late 80s, early 90s, Parramatta played from March to September and they didn't play finals football. And uh, Canberra was my second team in those oh, days. And um, I, I don't know how or why, but I actually, because uh, I live in Penrith, so I, I just, don't like Penrith, um, the Panthers. <laughs> so um, I don't know why or how, but I ended up buying a, a Canberra Raiders flag and running it up at a, a, one of the main streets of Penrith. I think it was after the game. I think it was. <laughs> I think it might have been nineteen ninety. It, it might have even been ninety one. Anyway, as well, but um, yeah, good time, <laughs> funny time being a kid, yeah. just trying to razz up the crowd in Penrith, but. Yeah, no, they certainly were champion teams back then. And which of the premiership teams do you think is the is the is the best premiership team? Because a lot of people say that the '94 team is probably one of the best um, to win a competition. Unfortunately, we didn't see them play the Brisbane Broncos in a grand final at that time because that would have been everyone's major best game that would have happened. But that ninety four team, how does that how does that rank compared to the other ones? Oh, just on on paper and numbers, you'd have to say it's the. Uh, they were just fantastic. That the, it was, mostly internationals and, yeah, they were nuts. I, I think the the team the year before, um, it's a shame that Stewart broke his leg, because that's um. I think that team was probably better. That team, like that, you just look at the through the season for and against wins and losses. They were, um, they were way, way ahead of everyone. I think that's everyone. when you beat us sixty eight nil. I think. Yeah, and that, that was game. like the, the the last tackle of the day. Ricky Stewart breaks his leg, and that was the last game of the season, or maybe the second last game of the season. But then they didn't win another game. They so you've got basically the best of the Australian New Zealand teams, and um, without that centerpiece, without the general, they couldn't win. And that was, I've heard so many stories from the other players going, how, how like, it, Ricky's not that good. <laughs> What's yeah. Going on? It's, we're still, we're still all internationals. We still should be That's able right. to, you know, catch the ball and tackle and score tries. Why can't we? Um, but yeah, Rick was that influential. Um, so yeah, I think on paper, I'd say the 94 team was probably, would, would have been the best team, but the, the 89 was the most exciting because it was so unknown. The 84 yeah. team, the 94 team was well known. They were all a well known quantity by that stage. Whereas 89, you know, Benny's field goal goes over instead of hitting the crossbar and Belmain win. Would those players have gone on? Like, did that, did those players win because they were awesome or did that win give them confidence to, to keep going? Cause that's, that's, there's so much luck involved in that, that 89 game. Um, that was not a dominant display. That that game was alive oh, probably until midway through extra time. Yeah. But the whole way through it, anyone could have won that. And um, it was that close. And the, the teams were so different stylistically. Um, but they were, you know, there's so many. There's, there's got to be books written and films made about it, the amount of drama that went into that. And, you know, Laurie, uh, again, Ricky not left his boots in Canberra <clears throat> That's right. Yeah, and borrowed David Campisi's boots because he knew they had the same size foot. Um, so <laughs> just grand final day, Sunday morning, Campo, it's Rick. Can you bring your boots to the footy stadium? Um, and the McNeil ankle tap on, or the, the Melmaninga ankle yeah, tap on tap. McNeil like that. Yeah. There was so much unknown about the Raiders, but by 94, it was known. So that, you know, they were awesome. Didn't have quite the excitement of the unknown and seeing what what unfolded. Yeah, Having I know said that, 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 that opening minute, and Marty Bellin knocking on the <laughs> kickoff, and then Paul Osborne inventing the offload. Um, 
with number 46 right. on his back, I think it was. Hang on a second. <laughs> oh, the fancy collection there, look at this is. I don't own this. This isn't mine. <laughs> this actually belongs to. Oh, it's, there it's, we go. It's, look at that it's, piece. It's the actual one. And I've got yeah, to get wow. it back to him. I was supposed to be meeting up with him to get it back to him because um, <laughs> it's the heirloom for his kids. What I love about it, this yeah, is the actual wow. jersey he invented the offload in. Yeah. And you look at it and go, he hasn't had that under a frame. He's been out cooking barbecues going, <laughs> did I tell you about the time I invented the offload in 94? <laughs> I wonder if uh, Steve Jackson does that in his uh, 89 jumper. <sighs> I reckon he does for sure. So he, he he goes on the ABC as a guest frequently. And as a joke, we, like he's from, they call him the mayor of Mackay because he's That's just, right. he's a big yeah. man about town. And he's actually running for mayor. He's genuinely yes. now running for mayor. <laughs> and no doubt he'll get in too. He's very popular, oh, very popular. So. Like I've had him on the podcast a few months ago and uh, the great chat um, with, with Jacko. Um the uh, I've lost my train of thought there. Um, what about some favourite Canberra moments? Um, it doesn't have to be obviously the grand finals, but like some favourite Canberra moments that stand out for you from over there. Oh, the, the biggest one was 2019, the game against the Storm in Melbourne. Uh, it was August, oh, it was, was mid August, and um, I was on the road, I was doing it like a tour with rugby league, the musical, I was playing in Coffs Harbour. So I'm there setting up and I've got my laptop out and I'm watching the first half as I'm doing sound check, as I'm setting things up and the store and um, Whiten gets sent to the sin bin and the storm score. And then Tarpane gets sent to the sin bin and then the storm score. And then the storm score again from this, this stupid intercept, a ball bounced and it was picked from, um, I think it was Kotrick's hands. Like he's just, grabs the ball and suddenly it's gone and 18 nil and it just looked devastating it looked horrible and i was thinking god they, if they can just get a try before half time and then toots goes over scores his try where he's got the ball kind of jammed between his head yeah. and his forearm and he hasn't got his hands on it but he got down with pressure with his head and his forearm and i still remember the um uh what's the brisbane coach walters kevy Kevy was Kevy. commentating and um, Kevy's commentary, he was so, he was nuts with his commentary. He got so excited and he, um, the bunker goes, you know, he has the ball pinned to his arm and he gets down with pressure. And Kevy's like, so he had it pinned. He had it pinned, was he? He had the ball pinned. And he was over the top and it's like, oh, okay, they've got to try. Then finished the sound check, went back to the hotel, got some takeaway dinner. I'm sitting there watching it on Fox, just watching it go. And I just lost it when they won that game. Um, and this is against a, you know, a, the full strength. I guess they didn't have Cooper Cronk, but, but it was a, you know, a Cam Smith led team. And um, that was, I think that was the best win the club had had against Melbourne, such a powerhouse for that entire decade or two decades um, in Melbourne, where the, the Raiders had a really bad record, and that was yeah, that was just amazing. How did the how did your show go after that? Oh, best show I'd ever done. I was yeah. in such a good mood. <laughs> yeah, was, yeah, all sorts of gags were being cracked. The Raiders song got played in full, just <laughs> just <laughs> kind of snuck in there somehow. Yeah, um, yeah, I was in such a good I, like just yeah, huge, really good mood. <laughs> yeah, oh, don't blame me for that one. Well. You mentioned their rugby league the musical, and um, how did how did that all come about? Did you think you just need to do something like that? And <laughs> yeah, you know, you're a pretty good comedy writer for songs. Oh, it it was actually all accidental. So I used to back in eighty six, eighty seven. I was I used to busk in Canberra, and this is I don't know if you remember the Doug Anthony All Stars. They they were oh, a comedy yeah. group, and they used to busking. That how they started was busking in Canberra, and they used to get a big crowd, and and I. You know, you see people busking and they're sort of playing Bob Dylan songs and whatever. Um, and I thought I wanted to do something a bit extra. So I didn't I didn't have the people to bounce off because on my own. So I just, I put on little costumes. So I do a George Michael song. I had a leather jacket. I yeah. do um, uh, a Who song. I'd put on a fake nose. I had a cardboard box that I made out as an amp and then I'd smash it with my guitar afterwards. Um, did the Raiders theme song yeah. um, with 
pull the Raiders jersey on. And I, I, I don't, I know I changed the words to some songs. I have no recollection of what they were. Um, but yeah, it used to put on a bit of a show and, and um, it was the changing words and the costumes. It was, it was just kind of the fun thing. I used to get bored public servants at lunch. I'd, I'd play for an hour and people come down, you get a couple of hundred people around and you know, 1987, getting a hundred bucks in coins, you go to the bank and they count the coins out and you get a hundred bucks. Like that was, that was pretty good yeah. money for an hour's work. And I was doing that a couple of times a week and then getting, um, um, on Friday night, they'd have a public service happy hour at the Department of Finance or whatever, or some little group. And so they'd say, oh, can you come and play at our party? It's like, yeah, sure. There's another 50 bucks and they'd pass the hat around. There's another 50 bucks. And as, you know, as a student that I was at the time, that was great coin. Um, I then spent years playing in bands, being a serious musician, trying to be a pop star and um, ended up through a long, you know, writing, writing music for TV shows, music for films. Um, and that was supposed to be my career path. That was where it was going. And then, you know, soon as shit happened, there was some industry changes and that didn't work out. Um, but I ended up, I took a year off and then um, I took a year off because I got, <laughs> I got sacked. I was working on the footy show. Okay. I was doing, I was music director on the footy show and I had all these ideas. I kept throwing at them and they were like, oh, you know, a bit too cerebral for our audience. And that always pissed me off. But then, um, we got boned. I was a, the music director. We had a little band and I think we were just too expensive and we got boned. And uh, I got a royalty check the week, the day after I got boned from that, I was really disappointed. Um, we've been on for like three or four weeks. Uh, I got a royalty check from, I did the music for Australia's next top model for like okay. five or six years and got this royalty check from, it was a combination of Canada, South Africa, England, um, US and, and this royalty check was like twice what the footy show was going to pay me for the whole year. Yeah, wow. And I just went, I'm I'm taking time off. I, you know, I had some bad personal things happen. I'm just taking time out to heal and work out what I want to do. And just for fun, I started writing songs because I'd, I'd written some stuff for the footy show. I'd written some stuff for Reg Reagan. Video killed the rugby league star was his oh, yeah. big one. But um, uh, did the the original That's Gold recording with um the chief. Um, so I, I did a theme song for the footy show in 2006 and that was, that was kind of what started me in rugby league okay. music. And that was an earnest song about being a footy fan. Um, and they used that as their theme. And then the NRL used as their theme for the semifinal. So I was going playing this song live at four or five, six semifinals, which was great fun. Um, so in 2009, big fan of the Monday night footy show on Fox. That was not a, iron my son's school shirts and you know, yeah. do all the laundry and watch the footy. Yeah. Um, and I started sending in songs to them. because I did some work at Fox as doing audio. Uh, and the first one was a song for the Gary Freeman show. He kept on the Monday night show. He'd just sit there and wind up Gordon Tallis <laughs> and say, seriously, you go to your fool. When I get my show, you're going to be sacked. And he's like, you're never getting your show. He says, yeah, I am. So I did a, a show theme for the Gary okay. Freeman show. Yeah. And they knew nothing about it, but the, the producers put it on and Gary and Gordon tells us like, no, no, that's not happening. What, what's going on? And um, Wayne Pierce has gone, no, you did that. No, you're not talented enough. No, someone, someone else has done it for you. And the Gary Freeman has gone, see, this is what I'm talking about. The wizard has fans. So that <laughs> from that, I did a couple of other songs, did the Wayne Jr. Pierce song, did a Gordon Teller song. Um, from that, I don't know, just, just, kept doing bits and pieces got on the Maddie John show when it was on channel seven and was doing a song for them for the finals. That was in 2010. Um, and just kept doing stuff. And then I finally ended up with that's in Queensland. I, there was a community radio show called fire up, which is still going as a podcast. Yeah. Um, for like I, I listened to yourself on that a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, Well, there you go. They're good guys. Um, those ones. Oh, they are. They're great. But their whole attitude towards it that, you know, it's a thing for me being a musician, having a, a, a long career as a musician, just the combination between music and, and rugby league, it doesn't happen. There's no, there's, there's so few people in the arts or music scene who are into rugby league. That's Whereas it, in Melbourne, yeah. in Melbourne, there's heaps, you know, yeah, okay. yeah. Paul Kelly and you, there's people are writing songs about footy and that's okay. If you go on Google and look up, um, Australian sports songs. There's hundreds of AFL songs, two for league, two for 
you know, a, f- a few yeah. for cricket, but there's more for horse racing than there is for rugby. Yeah, okay, wow. Okay, well, um, yeah, definitely a market there, then, isn't there? Yeah, well, Back I think the that, yeah, I think the, the market needs to be, um, I, I do think that Google page is out because I think there's more like the the day that um, Johnny Sattler broke his jaw. That was, that's a great song. Um, so there are definitely songs out there, but they're not as much as, as AFL, and that pisses me off. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I just started doing, a, they had a, the fire up boys had a state of origin, um, do, they couldn't broadcast it obviously, but they, all the fire up listeners all went to the uh, FBI radio, the, the community station had, they had a tie in with the place in King's cross, they, um, the King's cross hotel. So they just got out on the third floor, put yeah. the big screen up and all the fire up people came in and listened and they got me to do a halftime song. And that was when, this is the year that Ricky Stewart said, if we beat this team once, I'll be happy because it's such a good Queensland team. Yeah. So I did the uh, the old Meatloaf song, One Out of Three is Bad, the Ricky Stewart <laughs> song. Um, the following year, they had the same thing, but I was going to be over, I was with a, I was producing a band that was going to be playing at a club in Mexico of all places. So I'm over in Mexico and they I couldn't do the function, but I had the idea for, because oh. Greg Inglis, clearly wasn't a Queenslander. And then the, there's a couple of articles I saw where all these people who weren't from Queensland who played there. And um, someone did a, uh, Anthony Sharwood, I think it was, did an article where he did the math if all of Greg Inglis's tries were added, taken from Queensland and put to New South Wales, Queensland hadn't won a series <laughs> in, you know, in five years, but they'd won, yeah. they'd won all of them. Yeah, wow. Um, and... I just had this vision of, I was going to get a video and walk up to people and say, so to the Queensland team, where are you from? So you're from, um, and get him to say, yeah, I'm from Bowerville. That's yeah. in Queensland. I'm from, and I just couldn't work out how to do it. And then they wanted me to do that, do a song for the halftime thing. And I just had this stupid melody in my head and I'd had it for about a year and a half and, um, so I'll just do it. And then I, recorded a mate of mine who's big into music theater he did the he was the chorus singing that's in queensland along with me and he gave that really over the top exuberance um to it and i listened to it and it cracked me up but i just thought this is a peculiar piece of music it's show it's vaudeville or it's you know it's not really a rugby league kind of sound yeah (laughs) yeah um, so i didn't think much of it so i've made the video sent it to them um, uh, I literally was uploading the video while I was waiting for the pl- like waiting to board. Going, yeah. come on, come on, come on. Finally got uploaded. Then went to Mexico. Heard nothing of it. Flying back while the game's on, trying to say to the hostess, "Can you get the pilot to see what the score is in State of Origin? What's that? It's, it's a football game. It's like <laughs> you know, it's kind of like it's kind of like Super Bowl, but it has meaning." Yeah, yeah. I said, no, I really mean it. Can you please get a score? Do it, do it. So anyway, land in Sydney, turn my phone on, and if I may quote Ricky Stewart, there was 150 texters on my phone. I had just, it, my phone blew up. And when you see 150, you're going, what the? What, like, what's, what's happening? And they're all like, man, that song was awesome. Where is it? Where can I find it? That song was awesome. Can you play it again? And so I called the guys and five said, what the hell happened? And they said, oh, we got to half time. You put your video on and people were just roaring going, play it again, play it again. So they put it on <laughs> again. They missed like the first five minutes of the second half because they just kept playing the video over and over again. So I, um, I put it on YouTube. I edited it, put a little, um, rugby league musical thing on there. Cause I'd had that idea. I love that name. That it's yeah. such a stupid name. There's nothing musical about rugby league that no. like you just can't do it and um so i put that on and put the clip up and then shared it to the fire up group and then suddenly bang it's just i was sitting there looking at youtube just refresh ten thousand views refresh fifteen thousand views refresh it was just really yeah. going absolutely nuts um so my idea that that song uh you know wasn't really rugby league well i was wrong it uh, yeah, definitely <laughs> Yeah, but it was great fun. It went oh, nice. for, for sure. I mean, every every state of origin time it gets played and, yeah. and uh, gets stuck in my head too, uh, well, being a New so, South Welshman as well. And from that, from that song, I started playing at corporate functions. Um, 
I had actually played a show, a rugby league, the musical show at Aswith Leagues Club before the before that song was done, like the year before, where I had okay. I'd done enough with Fox Sports and had enough other songs to put a um a show together, and that was I did it with a live band and had the video clips playing. Um, but the real the real way that rugby league the musical came out was I played at a referees function. Uh, it was uh, Dutchy the Touchy, what's his name? Um, Holland. Oh no, I see him at the games. I hope he doesn't listen to this stuff. Right? His real name is Dutchy the Touchy. But um, I was playing at a presentation where he was being awarded as the most capped touch judge ever. The you know the most flags and was told a whole lot of secrets about him and also a whole lot of secrets about Shane Haynes who had these songs about these okay, guys. Yeah. And I'd written a song for it called the referee's victory song. And this was just a, you know, I figured all the other clubs, all the clubs had one, the referees should have one. So I made this piss take victory song for the refs. And um, I loved Jared Maxwell's voice when he was in the video, when he was in the bunker. So all the, the refs used to call him caps lock. Because he's always talking in full voice, like it, it's like Blackboard off um, Mr. Squiggle. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, but he's always loud, and I, his voice was just a lot of fun. So I, I said to the guy who was MC, "How about instead of introducing Dennis Carnahan to sing the referee's victory song, you introduce Jared Maxwell to sing the referee's victory song, and I'll come out with a big fake nose and fake teeth, and um, and then I got loaned a referee's shirt, which I have still got, so I stole." Um, <laughs> and short, like a full kit, the black socks. Yeah. And so they said, oh, ladies and gentlemen, now it's a special treat to sing the historic referee's victory song. Would you please welcome Jared Maxwell? So everyone's looking at him going, oh, what's going on? And he's there looking horrified because he's quite a proper gentleman. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's thinking, what's going on here? Yeah, yeah, he was. Well, I don't know. You but then I walk it? out with the, you know, the shorts up high, <laughs> the shirt tucked, the pink and black shirt tucked in. And a whistle, oh, how are you, fellas? Great to be here. And and did the song. And um, you know, at the end of it, you know, did the rest of the, did, did a couple more songs. Um, Todd Greenberg was there. He was, <laughs> I did the Todd Carney song, which was pretty popular at the time. <laughs> but it was pretty controversial doing it. Yeah. Toddy Greenberg. Toddy yeah, Greenberg definitely. was there blank face. <laughs> and, but his wife was just wetting herself laughing at <laughs> Um, so yeah, that was, that was a fun thing, but it gave me the idea of, so I had all these songs. I've been working these songs up, so they're getting played on ABC, getting played on, um, uh, 2UE was playing some of them and 2GB as well. So when there was a 2UE, 2GB was playing a Fox sports would play a few and put film clips to them. Um, so I had this body of work and I was trying to get how to present it as a live thing and doing the horse Maxwell impersonation gave me the clue. So that's what the show is. It's still, okay. you know, yeah. this year I'm doing the show in a few weeks and it's yeah. all songs from this year. There's only two or three classic songs that I've done before, but all of them, it's like a season review, but each part okay. is presented by, you know, Jared Maxwell's still in the show. He presents the pantomime section. Um, then there's a slapstick is presented by um, Dan Ganane. Uh, oh, dress up as Dan. Dan. <laughs> Wayne, Wayne Jr. Pierce. Uh, select does the heroes section and there's various other people that do villains and controversy and uh so yeah it's it's kind of silly and the more you explain it the more lame it sounds but when <laughs> when it's actually performed um it's great fun. And th th some of the most fun has been like when wayne jr pierce turned up and there's i there are my addresses wayne jr pierce yeah. singing about wayne jr pierce to wayne jr pierce or I used to do Peter Beatty. He was part of the show, but he's since the Volandis has come in, I've, I've, I've ditched him from the show. I haven't got Peter Volandis in there yet. I probably need okay. to. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I did. I, 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 I Peter Beatty came for the show and um, yeah. there was, I dressed up as Peter Beatty, being Peter Beatty, going out and shaking Peter Beatty's hand. And um, yeah, that was, that was a lot of fun. So just on that um, with people coming to the show and uh, you, imitating them has anyone ever has everyone taken it in good um what's the word good in good in good humor yeah they yeah have. in good humor I'm, or has anyone ever um like been I've, I've upset a, and disagreed never with? had a bad response live um i know that's in queensland i i reversioned it when ben teo joined the team because like he was greg inglis 
you know, it it's touchy. Like he played junior footy in New South Wales. He played for Hunter Sports High when he was 16. So technically he could say it, but he was actually in a position where according to the laws at the time, because he was yeah. playing in Brisbane and he was much more sold on by the people he was staying with, by the family he was staying with. And they were talking about Aboriginal culture, Aboriginal heritage, and you know, it's more respected here, which I'd argue against given that Laurie Daly was the coach at the time. Um, but you know, it was his, it was because of the rules, it was his choice. Whereas Ben Teo was a dead set ring in who played for Samoa. He played for the junior Kiwis. He then played for Queensland. He then left and played rugby for England. So yeah, <laughs> what's going on there? Yeah. So that that's, which well and good, tremendous athlete, great football player. Um, but I'm, <sighs> I'd say the word mercenary, like, and, and I don't mean it meanly. Like he's he he was a gun for hire. He played for the Rabbitohs. He won a premiership. Fantastic player, but to me, that's not what State of Origin's about. State of Origin shouldn't be the most professional players in the world. It should be Queenslanders who hate New South Wales, and New South Wales having the best players. Going, why do these people hate us? And why do they keep beating us? That that's the Origin <laughs> myth. So Ben Teo being in there. So I did a song about where specifically the first verse was about him. Okay, yeah. And um, it was played to him at a press conference and he went nuts. And I'm so glad I was never there. And I'm terrified of one day bumping into him because um, yeah, he was very unhappy and Mel shut down the press conference. It's the only time the Queensland press had been locked out of state of origin. Um, other than that, um, you know, I do the songs presuming that I'm going to sing, that I'm going to see the person because I played a lot of functions where I'm singing a tribute song, you know, a roast song for someone. Like I played the Eels presentation night. So that's what you'll find online, that the Nathan Hindmarsh song and the Luke Burt song. Yeah. And they were written specifically for their retirement years. And um, I remember playing it at that function and I had the film clips next to me. And um, uh, Tim Banner was sitting in the front row. And most of the people, the whole idea of having film clips is that if people don't follow every game of rugby league, people don't know what's going on. The film clip explains gives context to the gag so they know what's going on um i find a lot of league nerds get really caught up in the detail of film clips because they're like oh i remember that game that was round 23 and i'm not yeah and and generally it's actually the lesser league fans who find it funny because they're not getting caught up in the detail that they're kind of getting caught up in the music and the humor um but it means that people who are used to watching tv with an iphone you're looking at the tv you got your phone you're playing a game you're texting you're watching the tv they've got me seeing as a performer and then they've got the tv so it's a, it's it's a modern engaging thing people that's like right yeah, sitting yeah. And watching back like and a forth. tennis match yeah except for tim manor who was sitting in the front row arms folded staring at me just looking at me <laughs> and his face he had i think he has resting angry face and it, he's the most peaceful lovely happy guy yeah. i'd never met him before and all I'm looking at is this enormous man who's looking pissed, staring at me, shit canning his mates. And I'm going, oh, what's doing? What's going to happen? And I was like, I was really put off by it. So I was sitting there, did the Bertie song, did the Hindy song. Everyone got up and clapped. I finished, got down. Luke Burt came up and shook my hand, gave me a hug. Hindy shook my hand, gave me a hug. And then I see Tim Manor walking towards me and again blank face and you think oh and i have i have literally i clenched my jaw and kind of stepped back because i thought i'm about to cop one and he's leaned in and i go and he's giving me this hug and go oh man that was beautiful that was so beautiful that was because like you're mocking him but it's so respectful it was actually be- it was beautiful because like, you weren't laughing at you laughing it was like oh okay i'm alive yeah so that was the, yeah. that was the closest i come. <laughs> but yeah, other than that, um, like I said, I, I do it assuming I'm going to sing it to the person. So I, cheeky, but not disrespectful. Yeah, no, nah, that, that's true. I mean, uh, I mean, we all got to have a laugh these days. I mean, usually everything's too serious, isn't it? So got to have yeah. a laugh. And as you said, if it's respectful and uh, and that, then, yeah, it's all good. And, and the other thing I always focus on, like I've sung for years, it's been my, my job for 30 years um i kind of think I, I, like i really have to work on the singing work on the song not trying to like sing them as best as i can sing them at the most elite level because if you're going to take the piss out of an elite sportsman i think you got to 
you got to be doing it really well to earn the right to do it. Yeah. Like, I've got, so I'm, I'm training hard. I'm rehearsing hard. I'm doing a lot to make sure that, yeah, if I'm going to take the piss, I'm not going to drop the ball while I'm doing it. I'm going to actually do it. Okay. And at the moment I'm nervous because in the shows, I've got the Ryan Pappenhausen song coming up and it's, um, to, yeah, some of the, some of them are pretty demanding. Yeah. The Ryan okay. Pappenhausen song is a bit demanding. So like, if I ever sing to him, <laughs> is there a yeah well yeah definitely that one how good is it look at yeah it. yeah that's it. it right here yeah that's, look at that yeah that that is um pretty good although i think just seen in the last couple of weeks i think it's gone a little bit shorter i think uh, oh, it hasn't I, I think it's for the comeback but i think yeah, it's, okay. gonna, it's gonna yeah it's gonna take off going. take yeah. off I'll tell you what he's got a good ballot he's price cart right from the eel he's got a good uh Hasn't he? Good mullet going on. So it's a bit more old school though. It's not like the really long tail. It's um, yeah. The the, the, the fade. That's it. Well, speaking of the eels, is there any eels flavoured songs in the in the show coming up? There was last year. Yeah. Um in this That's probably because they were doing so well. Because they were doing well. And uh, there's a there's a kind of a line that um when you're laughing at people in power, that's satire. When you're laughing at people who are suffering, that's bullying. So, okay. yeah, so yeah. sorry, but at the moment, there's not a lot of eel stuff in there because um, last year there was three songs, I think. There was one, okay. like, one of my favorites was the Mitchell Moses song last year about that game against the Bulldogs where he's, you know, you lost against the Bulldogs and he's scored a consolation try and he's walked through and he's just like stopped. Yeah. Oh, look at me, I'm Mitchell Moses and bang, he gets knocked over by Burton and didn't Burton. score it. Um, did I say Richard Burton? No, yeah, I don't Maddie think Burton. so. Yeah, Matty Burton, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so that, and, and also at, at the end, I did the, uh, to the tune of um, Feelings, I don't know if that's by an old 70s tragic song. Um, I did Eels fans, because I was worried about all the Eels fans, because they were all so hopeful and so happy, and it's like, dude, you're playing the Panthers. It's, <laughs> it's not going to go well. And in the preseason, I had that many Eels fans, and you were one of them. Last year, <laughs> coming off, you'd won a trial game. So, yeah, this is a year. So I was trying to temper them, trying to come <laughs> down a bit and say, just, just chill. This year, no, no, yeah, no, no, at all. no, don't blame you. I mean, we probably wouldn't want to hear them to be honest, <laughs> but uh, uh, not being in the eight, so yeah, now very disappointing year for us. That that's for sure. Um, so when you were on uh the Matty Johns show working with that show, did you do did you help Eric Grove Jr. do his Mike Kevy and <laughs> um uh, what else? Uh oh. Fui Style My Thongs song? No, that was all that was all his own work. They were oh, was it okay? Yeah, because he's yeah, a musician as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's I, I thought you might have had that, a bit that of that Kevy song. That Kevy song that killed me. That was so yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> the whole stalking and watching him in his sleep business. That was, yeah, that was a cracker. Yeah, nah, that, that's it. That's it. Well, you said that the music, rugby league, the musical is coming up soon. Uh, where will be at, people be able to find it and uh, get tickets to and, and watch the show? You can get tickets at rugbyleaguethemusical.com.au or rltm.com.au. It's on the Bridge Hotel Roselle, five big nights, 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th, 29th of November. Jesus, that's three weeks away. I better get working. November um, or September? Uh, September. Sorry, September. September. Yeah. There we 20... go. September. So it's the week before the grand final, every, okay. every weekday before the grand final. Um, so, yeah, no, like, it's, it's, it's kind of, it kind of grows. It's, it's still very much an underground thing, but each year there's, you know, more journalists turn up, more rugby league. I haven't had a lot of players. I know when I played in Newcastle, a few players turned up. In Canberra, a couple of players turned up. Um, but in Sydney, the players don't turn up as much. Okay, yeah. Um, but there's a lot of behind-the-scenes people. And, I, you know, it's funny when you meet, I'll, I'll meet a journalist and go, oh, yeah, I went to your show. It's like, well, why didn't you tell me? Why <laughs> and why aren't you promoting it then? Um, but like I said previously, you know, um, Peter Grant, Todd Greenberg, Peter Beatty uh, um, came along. So a lot of uh, uh, NRL people turn up. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to build it as a tradition. The the annual review, yeah, yeah. get Abdo and Philandus to come along. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you might uh, quickly have a little bit of material after Andrew Abdo's minor premiership uh, speech. That was a bit <laughs> random. I don't know where. 193 don't... assists. Yeah, I, I had the same reaction as Dylan Edwards. I think. I think how did he get those figures and. 
was yep. it 45,000 kilometers that they've ran <laughs> during the season or something or more? I don't know. 100, where 193 is. assists. That was the big one, which is up oh. there with, it's, it's, again, that's up there with Ricky's 37 texters. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, we'll wrap Love things up with the uh, set of six uh, sort of personality questions away from rugby league. But um, what's your favorite sport outside of rugby league? Is there any? Um, <laughs> uh, look, like I said, I brought up in multicultural Canberra. I'd, I'd probably say cricket. Okay. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I played hockey when I was at school. Um, I, I still, I still follow the AFL. Um, I kind of climbed on board the giants when they came in. Um, so, you know, nice to see them in the eight as well, but, um, yeah. So I'd say the number one would be cricket. Yeah. Nice. Uh, what's your favorite holiday destination? Ooh, you know, probably just South coast, little yeah. Canberra by the sea around Batemans Bay, Mossy Point, Browlee, um, because that was a holiday place when I was a kid. Okay. So yeah. it's just going down there. It just feels like, yeah, it's how it's supposed to be. So I'm assuming you're probably like a, a little bit like the players. You got like March until October and then you have an yeah. off season. Yeah. So the off season for, um, so for my ABC work is, you know, there's still, there's AFLW, there's a lot of cricket. The ABC does a lot of women's cricket, does a lot of men's cricket. But it's much more sporadic. It's not that the grind of you well, know, week in, week four out. days a week, week in, week out. So yeah, it's a bit of off season now. What's your specialty dish in the kitchen or on the barbecue? Uh, I've got a few. Um, probably the main specialty is a. I, I just I call it a spag bowl, but it's not really a spag bowl. It's a. It's like a. Um, Bolognese sauce is, you know, from Bologna. That this is from. It's a Tuscan sauce. I went. Uh, I was had a holiday in Italy, and we stayed in this little town. And there's this. Re- there's one restaurant in town. Like the town was an old medieval town, about ten people living there. And the restaurant people would come for miles around to go there, and um, they had these lamb shanks in this sauce. Everything they had was basically in this one sauce. And we got invited in to see Nonna who every morning Nonna would get up and just get this massive vat and just chop up tons of carrot, onion, celery, chuck it in with olive oil and just sit and stir and stir and stir this huge vat. And the timing had to be impeccable because the difference between caramelized carrot, onion, celery, raw, so you've got raw, you got caramelized, you got burnt. And it's yes. like seconds. Fine line. That. And um, she'd do that every day. And then she'd, tortoise ratios showed me how to do it so I, I love just doing that so it's a rather than a bolognese sauce it's a tuscan sauce bit of a wank uh, but it's tasty as hell yeah well, that's it um is there a famous person out there that you would love to meet one day and have a chat or a, a famous musician perhaps Ooh. <laughs> i don't know that you haven't that you haven't met before. that i haven't met i don't know because I, I i had an incident a few weeks ago where i was I used to go because like I worked for the ABC as a sound guy and I used to go into the dressing rooms for the, for Raiders games. Even, even before I was working there, I, I knew a couple of players I knew a couple of staff, knew the media guy. Cause I'd done a lot of pre-match entertainment stuff and on field entertainment stuff with them and, and songs with them. Um, and so I went down the dressing rooms a couple of uh, three or four weeks ago. And it's the first time I've been in the Raiders dressing room since 2019 because of COVID. Yeah. And um, <laughs> in there chatting and, and the, players most of the players i knew aren't there anymore but i still know you know the ceo and the and the media guys i'm chatting with them and then Corey horsburgh works walks up and goes oh man i've got to get to um what the name of the street the, the marjorie whatever avenue and i'm like oh i'm, I'm going there I'm parked up there and i'm gonna I'll show you where it is like oh that'd be great and then media guy goes oh, i'll come with because i've got to go as well just hang on i've got to get my bag so i'll walk outside with Corey and <laughs> looking at this one he's 23 his kid and he's like g'day mate Corey and he puts his hand out and I went to shake his hand and my head just went and all I could think was I love you Corey I love what you bring I love your passion I love the fact that what you bring to the band and and what you bring to the to the team and and I love you know and when when 
um, that when the para fans were yelling at you, I was there and I was screaming, I was going to fight them all because they were yelling at you and you broke, you'd had a lids franking to me. They didn't know. And I, this was all going through my head at the same time as a little narrative going, you're 56 years old. This <laughs> is a kid. He's like, he's, he's younger than your son. Oh, you need to have some respect. And all that came out was, I couldn't speak. Then thankfully the media guy came out as I was, you know, did, uh, and said, oh, Corey, this is Dennis. He did that song that's in Queensland. So I'm like, oh, I was doing that the other day. Oh, it was great. So I don't know if I want to meet famous people because I just turned into a blubbering, gibbering fool. Yeah, no, nah, that's fair enough. I um, When I had Vince Sorrenti on the podcast for a chat. He was the one uh, that was yelling. <laughs> yeah, he was the one that was yelling at Corey Hall's bra. So. I was ready to go. I was ready. <laughs> Uh, maybe we could have a comedian off between Dennis and, and Vince. Cameron he was he para. was at that um the the para thing where I played the uh, Luke Burt yeah. song and the Hindmarsh song. He was at that. He would yeah. love that. He would have loved that. Great bloke. Um, is there uh, second last one? Is there three people, three players? I usually ask this about players, but um, is there? Is there three players or rugby league people that you haven't written a song about that you really want to write a song about? Oh, yeah. Okay. So I'm in the process of a Jared Croker song. And the problem with the Jared Croker song is there's going to be no piss take. It's just going to be an absolute heartfelt love song to to this guy. Um, The Luke Burt song, like when I did that, I went and I I spoke to... um, Nathan Highmarsh spoke to uh, who else was there? Nathan Kalis. I spoke to some of the coaching staff just to get stories about him, and there were none. There was yeah. nothing. All there was was he was a kid. He was hardworking. He was loyal. He was dedicated. He, you know, um, Wendell Saylor. I spoke to Wendell about him. Wendell declared him that he used the word unsledgeable, and he said he, he tried to sledge him, tried to put him off his game, and said, you're tiny, look at you, you're a piece of you, nothing. You know what? I'm going to throw you over the grandstand. If you don't, and if I don't throw you the grandstand, I'm going to find you in the car park afterwards and beat you up. I'm just going to beat the shit out of you. And he and was trying to intimidate him. <laughs> and so Luke Bird looked at him, stepped him, ran around him, scored a try, ran and just ran back. Didn't say a word, just looked yeah. at him, gave him a smile and a nod. Yeah. And so Wendell's like, well, I've got nothing. Yeah. So that, so I did the, you know, the comedy term is a mock epic. Like I made him out to be this grand hero. Um, whereas there's going to be nothing in that. Luke's, Luke, the uh, Josh, the the Croker song, the Jared Croker song is going to be a love song. Sam Williams is another one. And I, 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 I love Sam Williams. Absolutely love him. And again, it's because he's just, he's such a good clubman, such a good guy. I met Sam, it would have been 2010, I reckon. Um, I was doing pre-match entertainment for the Raiders. Uh, had a couple of singers with me. and My niece went to uni with him. Okay. And he just started playing with the Raiders. So it was, I can't remember the exact year, but I know it was the year that Matt Orford signed for the Raiders and knocked on at the scrum base against the Titans. And the Titans won in Golden Point because of that knock on. And Sam Williams was in the reserve grade. And he was walking around the, the tradies club <laughs> afterwards going, oh, I'm playing first grade next week. How good. <laughs> and we ended up going to Mooseheads with, him, my niece, my niece's mate who ended up becoming Sam Williams's wife, who funnily enough is Ashley Gilbert's daughter. Like they, okay, Sam Williams wow. married Ashley Gilbert's daughter. Um, but Sam, we're changing moose heads and Sam's telling me, I, I was having problems. I was coaching my son's rugby league team. And there's a couple of, there was one particular dickhead parent who was a real nightmare. And he, he um, there was a couple who really wanted to coach, but the club didn't want to because they wanted the kids fighting. They wanted the kids punching. They wanted the kids. And so I got thrown in. I got, you know, I did the training course and stuff, but I had, had nowhere near the experience of these guys. Um, and I told Sam this, you know, what do I do? And then I, again, I'm talking to someone who's 20 years younger than me. And he's like, mate, that's what the club's for. You've got to understand what a club is. The, the footy club, if they've said that I want these guys coaching, this isn't your problem. Put it to them. Go and say to the club, go to the board, say, I need help here because I've got these parents who are being dickheads and get them to step in. This isn't your job. You want to coach the kids. You're not there for the parents. You're there for the, parents, for the kids. For the kids yeah. So do this. And he gave me this lecture about how to, how to, you know, game a footy club to get what you wanted. So I, I did it, went and spoke to some people on the board and they're like, no, you shouldn't have put up with that. And they, they went and managed it. 
And it's like, wow, getting that advice from a kid who he would have been 21, 22. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, that's so the Jared, the Sam, who's the third one I'd want to write about. <laughs> oh, I actually always wanted to write something for um, Styx Proven. Okay. And it's got out of the blue there, but I, I met the guy at a couple of functions and I have never met someone who he just shook my hand. Oh, CS Oli, I was probably a bit the same. He seemed like royalty. There's something about him that felt okay. really yeah, real when yeah. he shook your hand and looked in your eyes. But sticks, he shook my hand and I was like, oh, how far do you want me to run? I'm running. <laughs> what wall do you want me to run through? He just, you just felt this, you know, okay, that's why the dragons kept winning. That's like, he was such a, strong moving leader so I, I kind of i've got you know that's one i'd love to write a song about there you go there's three yeah no we'll can't wait for those ones to come out and look this one the last one will be a, a a probably a hard one for yourself because you're so involved with music but who's your favorite uh musician either band or, or solo artist oh boy um uh, I'd probably have to say Ray Davies is the singer from the Kinks. Okay. Um, cause that was, and I don't know if it's because of quality or because of, um, that was kind of what I, what first got me into music was a couple of the songs they'd written, um, as a nerdy little weird guy, they really touched me. They really, like, I really, I felt an empathy with them and I felt like they kind of, they were, um. Yeah, I don't know. I kind of adopted some of the um, philosophy of them, I guess. <laughs> um, and I got, as, as I listened to more and more, there was some weird stuff they did. And there was, uh, but yeah, some of the, there's a couple of albums they've got, which, you know, there's one particular one, which will be my Desert Island album. Unless, unless I chose Night at the Opera by Queen, because that will be, they're a very close second. And okay. not so much Freddie himself as the whole unit and what they yeah. produced. So yeah, Kinks and Queen, that'd be it. Uh, what's your favorite Queen song? Um, favorite album is definitely Night at the Opera, and the favorite is probably the Prophet song. Okay, not because of um, it's it's just so you know Bohemian Rhapsody is on the same album. This is just as long as Bohemian Rhapsody, and it doesn't have an operatic part in the middle. It has this part in the middle where he sings with himself. So, okay. do you know the song? No, no, I don't. I don't. Okay. I don't. It so he, it's it's a really it's a much more hard rocking song than um bohemian rhapsody but in the middle it stops and freddie sings a line and then there's a 500 millisecond delay and another 500 millisecond delay so he sings and now i know and now i know and now i know that you can hear me and as he sings that each now i know goes to the other channel Okay, yeah. And then the other one. So he's seeing three-part harmony with himself on delay, and it is just mesmerizing. So A, a to think of doing that, I've, I've never heard anything like it before or since, um, and B, to be able to do it. So, yeah, that um, very unusual and talented man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really? nah, definitely a legend for sure, and love Queen. They're, they're great. Saw them last time they came out. Uh to Sydney um, with Adam Lambert, uh, ju yep. just as good. I couldn't imagine what it would have been with Freddie as lead singer there in front of a massive crowd in in a stadium. It would have been awesome. But uh, yeah, great band, great band. Well, Dennis Cunningham, thank you very much for joining me today on the Paracade Podcast. We probably could have chatted for longer. It was very enjoyable, that's for sure. And uh, thank you for contributing to the Paracade um, with, the, <laughs> with the poster. Much appreciated and. We'll um we'll play the uh, YouTube videos of the this is that season Queensland and the eel songs are, um, and that and um we'll also support your rugby league the musical as well. well we'll post that up as well and get some fans there I might even have to come and check it out myself oh, you've, got to, you've got to come and have a look particularly knowing that there's no eel slapping <laughs> so, you know, yeah it's... and being a rugby league lover as well yeah. so uh, so thank you very much for joining me today on the Paracade podcast. No, thanks for having me.